in the House of Representatives. This majority needs to stop working to put American families at risk, start working to make our economy healthy. And I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Gentleman from Virginia. Madam Speaker, I now yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Georgia, the Republican Policy Committee Chairman, Dr. Price. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one and one half minutes. I thank the leader. As a physician, one of the tenets of medicine is first, do no harm. Sadly, the president's law does real harm. Now, the Supreme Court has said that the law is constitutional, but that doesn't make it good policy. It harms all of the principles that Americans hold dear as it relates to health care. It increases costs, decreases accessibility, lowers quality, and limits choices the wrong direction for our country. It harms patients, especially seniors, by removing $500 billion from Medicare and having 15 unaccountable bureaucrats deny payment for health care services, decisions that should be made by patients and doctors, not by government. It harms doctors, over 80 percent of whom in a recent poll said that they would have to consider getting out of medicine because of this law. And it harms our economy, killing over 800,000 jobs and making it more difficult for small businesses, the job creation engine of our nation to create jobs. And it's that much more frustrating because it doesn't have to be this way. There are positive solutions that don't require putting Washington in charge. There's a better way, and the first step to that better way is to repeal this law so that we may work in a rational and deliberative and, yes, bipartisan process for patient-centered health care, where patients and families and doctors make medical decisions, not Washington. The president's law doesn't just harm the health of patients and seniors. It harms the health of our economy and our nation. And the first step to replace is to repeal, and we can start today. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Connecticut. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, may I inquire as to how much time we have on both The gentleman sides from being... Connecticut has four and one half minutes remaining, and the gentleman from Virginia has five minutes remaining. Gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman for yielding. As has been said for the 31st time this Congress, the House Republicans are trying to put insurance companies back in charge of America's health care. The House Republicans are preoccupied with taking away the patient protections while they're keeping their own protections. I recently got a letter from a woman named Annie who lives in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area, and she told me how vital, how vital this law is to her and her family. Her husband is self-employed. He has diabetes. And thanks to the Affordable Care Act, the husband will finally have access to quality, affordable coverage. Annie's daughter is a pre-existing condition, and thanks to this law, the insurance companies won't be allowed to deny her daughter coverage. And Annie's son, a 25-year-old, thanks to this law, is able to get on his mother's health care plan and save the families a great deal of money. But today, the Republicans want to take that all away. They want to take away all these protections and these benefits that American families haven't had in the past. Today, the, Americans, the, the Republicans in the Congress want to put the insurance companies back in the business. The same insurance companies that took away your policy when your child was born with a disability. The same insurance companies that didn't allow you to have cancer surgery because you had a lifetime limit or they decided you were having a pre-existing condition. The same insurance companies that decided that your children would be kicked off their policies when you're 18. I don't think we should go there, America, but that's what repeal brings you. That's what the Republican plan is to give it all back to the insurance companies companies after 100 years of struggling to take it away and give the, give the power to the people to determine their own health care needs and the kind of policies that they need. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Virginia. Uh, Madam Speaker, I now yield three minutes uh, to the majority whip, the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. Gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to our respected leader for yielding. From the moment Obamacare was introduced, House Republicans and the American people have expressed concerns about the quality, the cost, and the effect that it would have on our jobs. We are here today because the Supreme Court ruling made one thing clear. It's up to Congress to do the repeal of the devastating tax increase and what it would affect upon our economy. As we all know, Obamacare stands today because the Supreme Court said it is constitutional as a tax. The Chief Justice stated in his opinion, members of this court are vested with the authority to interpret the law. We possess neither the expertise nor the prerogative to make policy judgments.
Those decisions are entrusted to our nation's elected leaders who could be thrown out of office if the people disagree with them. It is not our job to protect the people from the consequences of the political choices. But it is our job. And unfortunately, we have learned over the past two years this law has proven to be bad policy. And you know what's more importantly? It's filled with broken promises. We all remember President Obama's first promise. If you like the health care you have today, you can keep it. Well, that's not true. Eighty percent of those in small employer plans risk even keeping what they have today. The president also promised the law would bring down premiums by $2,500. But that's not true either, because it's already been increased 1200 CBO says it'll even rise higher. President Obama did promise, as I sat right here and listened to him, he would not add one dime to the deficit. Well, you know what? That's not true either. He's going to add billions of dollars. President Obama promised he would not raise taxes on those making less than $250,000. I mean, $250, Turns out Obamacare includes 21 new taxes, 12 of them on the middle class. Promises made, promises broken. There was another president from Illinois who is quoted as saying, as our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Well, now is the time to listen to the American people. Now is the time to put the patient first. Well, they are empowered. Now is the time to repeal and begin to bring this country back together with a quality of health care where the patient has the choice, not the government. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Connecticut. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself 15 seconds as we ask the dean of the delegation to step forward and just say that uh, aside from the platitudes that we've heard today uh, has been expressed by many on our side and then some of the eloquence of debate that we heard we continue to see no plan from the other side but a persistent endeavor to repeal a plan that would cost more than a hundred billion dollars to the taxpayers we recognize the dean of the house of representatives the gentleman from Michigan, John Dingell. I thank my good friend for yielding me. Uh, 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 will the gentleman now? suspend uh, just for a moment, please? For how much time does... For one minute. Gentleman from um, Michigan's recognized for one minute. I ask you to have consent to revise the extent Without my objection. This is a gavel I used when I presided over the passage of Medicare and when he presided over the passage of legislation called ACA. Its legislation takes care of the American people. I'm willing to loan it to my Republican colleagues if they'll use it in a good cause. It's even been on television with The Daily Show. But what is important here is you're going to win the vote, but you're going to lose the case and the debate because the American people know what you're trying to take away from them. This is the 31st time we've voted on this, and it isn't the law. It is, we have 44 days left to finish the business of this Congress, according to your WHIP's office. And interestingly enough, we're not going to deal with important questions like jobs, employment, the economy, the worst economy that the president inherited since the days of Herbert Hoover. And the American people are going to wonder why this Congress has not been doing it. Well, the reason is the Republicans have been wasting the public's time. And in those 44 days, they're not going to be able to do the nation's business. Unemployed are going to continue to be unemployed. I'll loan you the gavel if you'll promise to use it for something good, because it's a fine piece of wood, and its tasks in terms of dealing with the public's concerns are not yet done. But having said these things, I say shame. You're wasting the time of the American people. You're wasting the time of the Congress. You've told us how you're going to repeal and replace. Where is the replacement? It is not to be seen. Where are the steps that you should be taking about jobs and opportunity for the American people? They're not to be seen. You have the gavel. Use it. Use the leadership that the people have given you to lead the Congress of the United States. The Democrats will work with you. But you won't work with us, and you won't work for the American people. The time of dealing with the business of this nation 
is short. Gentlemen, time has expired. And the needs of the American people are great. But nowhere are we seeing anything done by our Republican colleagues except to get up and to Gentlemen, denounce time Obamacare. Has expired. I say have a more, out, a more enlightened outlook and to proceed to do the nation's business well. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Virginia. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I'm prepared to close and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Connecticut. Gentleman from Connecticut has two minutes remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I want to uh, compliment uh, both sides for the quality of debate that has occurred on this floor uh, over the last uh, a couple of days. Today we are here uh, for the 31st time to act on repealing the Affordable Health Care Act. I give my colleagues credit for their persistence, but I'm deeply troubled by the obstinance and the obstruction that they have demonstrated in an almost callow indifference to the needs of American families. Most importantly, the simple dignity that comes from a job that more than 14 million of our Americans are being denied. And we can't, in this great civil body, bring forward the President's bill that will create jobs. One of the people in my district, Singe Barton, said, do you not understand that you have plunged us into the dark abyss of uncertainty? The only thing that corrects, creates and corrects that situation is the simple dignity that comes from a job. And yet today, we spend our time on the floor talking about something where we should be working together, where members on our side of the aisle who would have preferred Medicare uh, for everyone, the majority of our caucus would have been there, and yet embraced a compromise that extolled the virtues of the Romney plan in Massachusetts. But there is no room for compromise on the other side of the aisle. So we can only surmise this, that you would rather see the president fail than the American people succeed. Person after person on both sides of the aisle have gotten up and talked about the need for us to come together. You embrace most everything that's in this plan, but would rather see the president fail than the nation succeed. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. Madam Speaker, I yield myself the balance of my time. Gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, I introduce this legislation on behalf of my colleagues so that we may all be on record following the Supreme Court's decision in order to show that the House rejects Obamacare and that we are committed to taking this flawed law off the books. This is a law, Madam Speaker, that the American people did not want when it was passed, and it remains a law that the American people do not want now. First and foremost, Obamacare violates President Obama's central promise to the American people that if they like their current health coverage, they can keep it. The vast majority of people in this country like the health care that they have and they want to keep it. But now, thanks to this law, patients across the nation are losing access to the health care they like. Millions stand to lose health care coverage from their employers because Obamacare is driving up costs and effectively forcing employers to drop health care coverage. Beyond that, Obamacare takes away from patients the ability to make their own decisions and individual choices. Instead of letting patients and their families work with their doctors to decide the best care, Obamacare puts Washington in the driver's seat to make health care choices for them and their families. Taking away choice, driving up costs, and making health care dramatically more expensive is not the prescription that Americans ask for. Madam Speaker, we know 
in this tough economy, we need to be doing everything we can to help our small businessmen and women. They are struggling because of uncertainty and facing the prospects of one of the largest tax hikes in history. Obamacare increases that burden by adding new costs and more red tape. The new harsh reality is that creating new jobs and bringing on new employees may just be too expensive and too burdensome if this law is left to stand. The President said throughout the health care debate, as did former Speaker Pelosi and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, that this health care law was not a tax. Well, we now know that the Supreme Court has spoken. It is a tax. Madam Speaker, it's time to stop all the broken promises and get back to the kind of health care people in this country want. It cannot be overlooked that Obamacare also has disastrous implications for the moral fabric of our nation. Despite the claims to the contrary, this law actually paves the way for federal funding of abortion, violating many in this country's individuals' religious, ethical, and moral beliefs. It is also the basis from which President Obama launched an assault on the religious freedom of millions of Americans by requiring employers to cover items and services with which they, and perhaps their employees, fundamentally disagree. Washington-based care is not the answer. There is a better way to go about pr improving the health care system in this country. The American people want patient-centered care that allows them to make the very personal decisions about health care with their families and their doctors. They want to keep the care they like. They want to see costs come down. And they want health care to be more accessible. That is the kind of health care we, on the Republican side of the aisle, support, and frankly, the type of care that the vast majority of the American people support. Madam Speaker, we have said since day one that we must fully repeal this law. Today, we can start over, and we can tell the American people we are on your side, that we care about your health care, we want quality care and affordable costs. We listened and we've acted. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. All time for debate has expired. Pursuant to House Resolution 274, the previous question is ordered on the bill. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to repeal the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and health care related provisions in the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act of 2010. Pursuant to Clause 1C of Rule 19, further consideration of H.R. 6079 is postponed. Pursuant to Clause 12A 